a little under three years ago, we did have a lovely conversation. You and I talked about you know, the, our ambitions to grow tourism in Ras al-Khaimah, to, to move uh, the needle from the half a million visitors back then to a million visitors by the end of 2018. We're well on track this year to not only achieve a million visitors, but actually exceed that. So we're gonna hit it right out of the park this year. But also the biggest target for us is 2025, where we aim to reach 20, sorry, three million visitors by 2025. Um, we, of course, you know, this comes together with the support that we have from our government, our ruler, uh, His Honor Sheikh Saud al Qasimi, who has been, you know, at the forefront of uh, driving tourism growth uh, with the support of also the other government entities who have come together, you know, on a round table to look at what exactly we need, what, what does that roadmap look like? And that came out of, an, of, you know, of our strategy, which we launched in January 2016. Uh, to uh, focus on growing tourism and using um, uh, you know, the natural assets of Ras al Khaimah and as you mentioned before, sustainability, where uh, we uh, look at building a sustainable future in tourism um, and protecting our environment. We also, in 2017, after you and I have met, um, have decided uh, to uh, be the official sponsor of the UN WTO's uh, sustainable, sustainable year for development um, uh, and this was not just a talk that you know or a logo that was placed with on UN WTO's activities and events with regards to sustainable tourism we actually invested in inviting UN WTO's uh, consultants to come and run an investigation across the Emirate and provide us with a report that shows the gaps of sustainability and what we need to do in order for us to become a truly sustainable destination, but also a destination that builds sustainably for its future. Now, of course, this report comes with a, a number of actions and activities that we, the tourism board, have to own, but then need the support of the hotels and the hotel establishments and the tourism establishments to come together and bring this to life and make sure that we are all aligned in driving sustainable tourism and sustainable tourism growth to the rest of the family. So we are today in a, in a, a great uh, position where we have a fantastic destination that works hard on protect, protecting its culture, protecting its heritage, protecting uh, its uh, people, uh, protecting the wildlife, marine life, its beaches and mountains. Um, and everything we've built so far on Jebel Jais has been uh, very much uh, eco-friendly and also sustainable. If we look at the zip line, the longest zip line in the world, we've used no machinery there. It's all, it all runs on your body weight. We've used, uh, uh, there is no usage of any fuel in that uh, particular uh, sport but also the VFR. So, so solar, correct? Solar. We've used solar energy across everything we've built on the mountains. We built the uh, first ever park on the mountains in the region at 1,300 meters high. It's a natural park. We used all the local resources from stones that come from the mountain, uh, uh, indigenous trees that come from the mountain to plant in that area. And we actually have uh, been very successful in launching this to the public because it is a, a public park uh, up at 1,300 meters. Meaning that you didn't have thousands of cement trucks coming in. Nor did we have any marble, nor did we have any, it all comes from stones, built from stones from the mountain itself, so, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and pebbles that come from the mountains itself for the, for the ground. Um, but it's really also important to mention that all the lighting in this park is solar energy, uh, with solar panels, so it really has been a fantastic opportunity for us to use you know, uh, the mountain and its, nat its, its natural assets to, to continue to protect that for the future. We also hired a lady who is actually of German origins, who is experienced in um, plant species uh, and has a, a great history and background in uh, not only uh, it, it teaching us about the history of these plants and the origin of these plants that live on the mountain, but also allows us to look at how we protect these plants and what, what type of plants we can nurse and move. Because as you know, some of those plants, if you move, they don't survive. So uh, in order to make sure that we don't uh, lose any of these plants when we 
build, we make sure we select areas where plants can be moved and nursed. That's, uh, that's wonderful. And going back to UNWTO and the consultants coming to tell you what you can do, I'm sure they could tell you a lot. But I think it goes the other way too a bit, just watching what you've been doing. Uh -huh. Just wanted to add that. Um, how are you differentiating your product, your destination? There's, there's a lot of Emirate uh, uh, countries that uh, have their unique mm -hmm. uniqueness. Uh, so in addition to your culture, nature that's unique to you, now the zip line, is that still basically the course? So uh, the, the real course, to be honest with you, that's been really a great differentiator is positioning us as the future hub of nature-based adventure tourism. So really focusing on the adventure side of, of, of tourism, where we see more and more people uh, you know, wanting to put the zip line on our bucket list, but looking also to connect with nature through adventure of hiking or mountain biking, or simply learning about the plants in, in the mountains and their origins and what beneficial uh, uh, remedies they offer, because some of these are herbals, herbal plants that offer you know different uh, uh, health benefits uh, whether you know you boil them or you some of them you add to milk or there's a lot of these plants that we are now studying to learn more and uh, this is a whole world on its own and it's uh, adventure is not just jumping out of a plane you know camping is adventure stargazing is an adventure mm. um, and, Good and, point. and and what is really uh, I think fascinating in Ras al-Khaimah as you go up to the mountains where there's very light, if any, light pollution, uh, and you're very close to the skies, and you know the skies are lit up like a chandelier. With, uh, with that is an adventure for most city dwellers. Absolutely. So, and, and then you know uh, there are times of year where you can actually see a shooting star, and now that's an adventure. So, uh, you know, it doesn't really stop at just the mountain biking and the hiking. When we talk about adventure, this is where, why, why we think we have a great opportunity for us to position ourselves to be the the future hub of, of adventure or nature-based adventure tourism. As the tourism product have become a bit more developed, which markets are you now looking to uh, target? When you and I talked uh, three years ago, um, our top markets were, you know, uh, at pr pretty much our only markets were Germany, UK, and Russia. Now that remains the fact that, you know, since we started all in these countries, they remain to be our largest source markets, with Germany number one, Russia's now has moved to number two since the uh, visa regulations have changed in the UAE, where Russians do not, do not require a visa any longer, so they arrive at the airport and, and they have a, a visa on arrival. Um, uh, the UK market also continues to be a strong market, with a fantastic 20% growth year on year, is now at the third largest, India is our fourth largest. But we're seeing a great uptake from new entrants, such as um, Poland, Czech Republic, the Nordic countries, Scandinavia. Um, uh, uh, we're seeing also you know, double-digit and sometimes triple-digit growth from these countries. As we say, you know, we're coming from a zero base uh, from these countries, but however, I think the speed and pace of growth is what's really intriguing. We've recently um, opened a new route with Emirates Airlines into Croatia. Of course, Croatia is a small country with only 4 million people. However, there's about 600,000 people that travel outside Croatia. We are a small destination. We're not looking for the masses. So uh, this is exactly our fit. You know, this is perfect for us. This is the side of tourist destinations or outbound destinations that we are after. And the product uh, is not for the masses. The product is not for the masses, and it will uh, never be for the masses. And it's um, really positioned uh, when you say the people will experience adventure, including stargazing, that's really a very special comment there because you consider that adventure. It's not necessarily mountain climbing or you know hiking miles and kilometers, and it's very simple, passive adventure. That's true, exactly. How is this affecting the people in the local community? We've been really close to the local community. We've engaged the local community in our strategy. When we started, first of all, with the repositioning of Russell Khaimah and developing the new identity of Russell Khaimah 
to remove the misconception of the fact that Ras al was a destination that only offered great beaches and great beach resorts, which it does. However, there's many more assets that were never exposed, such as the mountains and the, the history and the culture and the heritage and the wellness um, uh, that uh, the Emirate has to offer. But this is where the community contributed to say, wait a minute, we have more. We have history, we have culture, we have heritage, we have adventure. Um, taking this on board is what allowed us to uh, create the identity and reposition Ras al Khaimah into what it is today. But also, job creation. We've been able to grow our uh, Emirati or local uh, employment in the tourism uh, board uh, to, th to reach 35% of the total employment. Uh, you know, this is a great achievement uh, wow. as they were not interested in the in this sector before. However, not only now that they're interested, they're very committed, they're keen, they see the value of promoting their country across the globe and, you know, creating a strong brand name like Ras al Khaimah now as, as we are, you know, becoming more and more known um, on the uh, uh, tourism map, uh, but also um, engaging with the local community by buying their local products. So we first seek local before we go outside for uh, products. Uh, we have engaged with uh, some of the widows in Ras al Khaimah who are great at making homemade cheese and homemade sweets and homemade food, uh, where we uh, now have regular uh, uh, markets, for example, weekly or bi-weekly markets, where we allow them to come and sell their produce to tourists uh, to experience. And, you know, uh, obviously they follow all the health and safety regulations that the municipality enforces. Uh, and, and great packaging, uh, but it just allows us to create these opportunities. And all the revenue is there. There's no fees all, for no, them to no, do this. No, fees. no, we don't have to pay any rent. And most of the investment for these, uh, for the tourism development, has come locally from the Emirates. Correct. And the revenues, the income, stays in the Emirates. Absolutely. Most of it. So in Ras al Khaimah, so far, the the largest contributors to the investment in terms of hotel development has been the local Emiratis, whether they come from Dubai or Abu Dhabi or Ras al Khaimah itself. We do have some international investors, but it is not in the same level as we have from the local uh, local market. Thank you so much. Thank Till you, the next Sarah. time. Thank you.